So, welcome to the latest Blue Deal debate, when we discuss our seas, our fishing industry, and the marine environment. I'm Chris Davis. I'm a former chair of the European Parliament's Fisheries Committee and a senior advisor to Rud Pedersen Public Affairs in, in Brussels. Today, we're talking about tuna, or tuna, I suppose, if you're in the States. Are we fishing it sustainably, or are we fishing it out? And this debate is taking place thanks to the support and sponsorship of the International Pole and Line Foundation. So thanks very much. Now, 90% of global fish stocks are either being overfished or fished at the maximum levels they can sustain. And in fact, last year, the United Nations said that 34% of fish stocks are now being fished unsustainably. Now, that should be very bad news for the future of the fishing industry globally. And with world population still growing at about 200,000 people every single day, that's bad news for all of us. More than 5 million tonnes of tuna were caught last year, and that's double the amount of two decades ago. Can we really go on like this? Well, today I'm joined by four guests, all of whom in their different ways have an interest in promoting tuna fishing that is sustainable. I could say as an aside that, you know, I could have picked up the phone and tried to find someone who say we fish unsustainably and we're happy to tell the world about it. But, you know, I didn't think it was worth making the call. So for people who believe that we need to make changes, we need to bring about improvements in, in different ways. Let me start, first of all, with Martin Purvis, Managing Director of the International Pole and Line Foundation, calling in, I think, from South Africa. So Martin, tell us, what is pole and line fishing or or one by one fishing, if you call it that? Uh, thank you, Chris, uh, for the opportunity to be involved in uh, today's debate. Uh, I'm really excited to be uh, today part of this discussion. Um, I think uh, tuna sits at the forefront of ocean conservation. You know, we are aware uh, uh, governments, policymakers, NGOs, civil society, responsible market actors are all involved in pushes for more sustainable tuna fisheries uh, and I really believe that if we all work together uh, and in the same direction we can achieve more sustainable more equitable tuna fisheries uh, and also very importantly fisheries that safeguard the livelihoods uh, of those coastal communities that they support. I'd also like to thank uh, Camille uh, Helena and Alex for uh, joining me for this discussion today. Um, you know, the first time I uh, uh, got introduced to uh, pollen line fishing was when I was uh, a cruise leader in the Indian Ocean uh, doing a, um, a pollen line uh, tagging trip. So we uh, tagged many tuna as part of scientific uh, studies done uh, under the auspices of the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission. I spent about three years of my life uh, out at sea on various uh, fishing vessels, uh, mostly industrial scale fishing uh, down in the Southern Ocean. Uh, uh, and, you know, being on a Poland line vessel for the first time uh, opened my eyes to really see the difference in how small scale fishermen operate uh, and, uh, um, and the way that they fish, the impacts that they have. Uh, the cohesion of the fishermen. Martin, uh, I, I, if I may interrupt you, I, I, I saw a video of Poland line fishing, a, a whole row, I think, of fishermen on a on a boat, sort of just <clears throat> flicking away here with tuna flying through the air. I, I've never seen anything like it before. No, it's an amazing experience. I mean, after the uh, the being the uh, uh, involved in the tuna tagging, we went fishing off Oman, Seychelles, uh, uh, Maldives, Madagascar. I also did another trip down to the Maldives and uh, went out on some of those pollen line fishing vessels. And it's amazing that this is a centuries old way of fishing, very low environmental impact. As I say, a lot of uh, community benefits, a lot of local ownership, employ many fishermen, and they've been doing it sustainably for, for centuries. Uh, and, you know, for me, there's just no question it is the best way to catch tuna, and you would be surprised if you see these videos, Chris, the the volumes of uh, tuna that actually come out of these fisheries. Uh, it's not only you know small volumes; it does supply markets. It supplies the supermarkets with their preferred choice of sustainable tuna as well. 
So there's lots of uh, opportunities to further develop these type of fisheries and really look at, um, you know, the broader context of ocean conservation as well. Well, Martin, you mentioned supermarkets. So let me turn now to Helena Delgado Nordman, who is the responsible sourcing manager for, for Tesco. Helena, I think Tesco is the Europe's fourth largest supermarket chain. Is that right? And you've just introduced a, a new tuna sustainability strategy. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity for being here today. It's a very interesting panel to be a part of. Um, yeah, Tesco is the biggest retailer in the UK and one of the biggest in the world. And tuna is one of our top 20 products. It's, a, it's a <clears throat> one of the most interesting products for our customers. And def therefore, we have a, a significant footprint in there and the responsibility for making sure that we're doing the right thing. And that's part of why we created that a uh, new approach to tuna sourcing that we launched earlier this month. So, you know, and I suppose uh, you want to carry on being able to supply your customers in a uh, hundred years time with tuna. Correct. And I suppose that, that, uh, that was also the reason why the Marine Stewardship Council was set up in order to ensure that we had fish stocks in a hundred years time or thereabouts. So let me introduce Camille Derricks, the program manager for program director for the Marine Stewardship Council. Uh, Camille, Thank you, Chris. What, and what proportion of tuna do you certify? What, what, and perhaps say a word. What is the Marine Stewardship Council? Yeah, maybe to start with the latter. Um, the MSC was created in the mid '90s as a market-driven initiative um, to create an incentive for sustainable fishing. So we are a global standard setter and an eco-labeling program. And what we try to do is fisheries that are recognised against our standard as meeting the standard for seafood sustainability they hopefully get a benefit in the marketplace and that benefit then becomes a piece of value, of inspiration for other fisheries to also improve and meet that standard. But that's in a nutshell, our theory of change where the, the bottom line of the MSC is obviously impact in and on the water. That mechanism functions um, over time, numerous improvements in fisheries management and in, in the practices of fisheries have taken place. Um, fisheries both working towards certification as well as once they got certified, they had to close out what we call conditions. So improvements fisheries need to make over the lifetime of the certificate. Also happening in tuna fisheries, we have all sorts of scales of fisheries in the MSC program, um, phone online um, operations, um, Martin already mentioned, MSC certified, but also larger scale fisheries and across different um, like species groups, tuna being a small part of that. Currently 25% of global tuna catch is MSC certified, so 75% of global catch is not certified. Um, and, and that means there's an incredible amount of improvement that still needs to happen across tuna fisheries um, to be able um, to, to meet the MSC standard. That's, uh, that's, still, a high, that yeah. that's still a high proportion, isn't it? Because I think uh, MSC manages to certify, what, about 12, 13% of all fish, um, or all fish legally caught. Um, because, as we know, there's a high proportion of fish globally caught illegally, um, but but tuna is 25%. So your weight, so tuna is obviously a very niche, popular, certified <laughs> some, something which people wish to see certified. I think there is a yeah, there is a growing public awareness that tuna um, is not always originating from well managed and sustainable fisheries, and that public awareness has driven retailers to make commitments to sourcing sustainable seafood. And MSC is typically used as a very good tool to verify that. And that has driven fisheries into the MSC program, starting off with actually the, the, the smaller scale tuna operations um, in the Maldives, but also on line operations operating on Albacore um, um, in the Pacific and the West Coast of the US. And that then drove larger fisheries interest to become part of the program. What I was gonna say, all these fisheries, all these tuna fisheries in the MSC program still have I would say a, a little bit of a, a homework assignment to deliver. Their management is still not at the level where they can pass against the MSC standard unconditionally. So they need to adopt harvest strategies and harvest controls in order to maintain their certification. And if that's not delivered in the years ahead, then obviously there might be a risk for their certificates becoming suspended, which would be regrettable. regrettable. And that, that's why I completely agree with Martin. This is about collaboration to drive improvement in tuna management, to get harvest strategies and harvest controls adopted by the competent authorities, which are the RFMOs. Let me turn now to Alex uh, Hoffert, Marine Wildlife Campaigner with, with WildAid, 
I, I, Alex, I looked, at, I looked at the Wild Aid website last night and you seem to have an enormous number of very famous ambassadors representing you. A lot of famous pictures there. Um, you're in the marine environment. What are you trying to achieve? So my background is uh, I lived in Hong Kong for about uh, 23 years. And um, during my time in Hong Kong, I was involved in a lot of shark conservation campaigns. So I'm sort of coming into this space from uh, the shark's angle, really. Um, and so, as we all know, the, the, the sharks is very, um, in, in, the shark species is very, very much caught up as a uh, bycatch in tuna fisheries. And so, um, you know, in my past uh, working life, I was working on reducing the demand for uh, shark fin, but now I'm sort of trying to look at ways to um, to stem the supply of, um, of, sh of shark into the market. And that involves um, taking some of the industrial um, tuna fisheries head on, really. OK, thank you. Thanks very much indeed. And indeed, that uh, sort of leads us into um, some basic questions here. Um, first of all, where, where, where are, uh, where's tuna caught? Where is tuna? I mean, I think I think uh, top of my, my line is, is Mediterranean bluefin tuna, because we knew no, the mafia was was trying to harvest it because it was worth a small fortune. But globally, I mean, I take it. Is it in the Pacific? Is that the main source of tuna? Who, well, it's in the Pacific. Oh. It's, in, it's, in, it's in the Indian Ocean. It's in the Pacific. Um, it's in the Atlantic. Uh, but the, the main problem areas and the, a lot of the controversy surrounding tuna industries in the last um, few weeks have been in the Indian Ocean, um, with some of the um, you know the fights at the international level taking place around the uh, yellowfin uh, tuna and um, these uh, populations of, of juvenile yellowfin are getting whacked by the industrial um, tuna fishing fleets from Spain and Italy. Um, so it's pitting the EU against the smaller coastal states, and that's been pretty much the, the nuts of the controversy that's been going on in the last few weeks. Okay, thank you. Martin, wh where's where's the market for tuna? I mean, who, who which countries eat tuna in vast quantities? I'm, I mean, for example, I, I did a piece with a, about... Uh, Aquaculture not so long ago, mm. and uh, China eats carp, for example, more than more than more than most things. But I take it in America or in Europe and Indonesia. Well, you know, is that right? Well, traditionally, uh, the the major uh, buyer of uh, tuna, exported tuna, has been Japan, obviously, uh, and in recent times that has grown to Europe, the US, uh, the UK. Uh, places where I live, Australia, uh, South Africa, Australia. Uh, but we should also not forget that there's a, a huge lot of these tuna fisheries are also uh, important for livelihoods, food security, and supply local coastal populations. The Maldives, for instance, has got the highest seafood per capita, co per capita consumption in the world. They are highly reliant on their tuna fisheries and have been for many centuries. Alex mentioned the discussions uh, at the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission uh, uh, two weeks ago. I was uh, very involved there. We have been working closely with um, many of the coastal states in trying to drive improvements. Uh, and I think the reality is that we, we really see this division between distant water fishing nations and coastal states. So coastal states are those that really have the right to the resource uh, and many of the fisheries uh, come from the outside uh, and basically cause destructive uh, destruction through gear types uh, that they use through the, uh, the overfishing, uh, uh, often capacity that's driven through uh, harmful fishery subsidies, for instance, uh, uh, and also some of the uh, impacts that the, the gear types like drifting fads have on juvenile populations. You know, in the Indian Ocean, for instance, over the past five years, Yellowfin tuna has been overfished, uh, and it's estimated uh, that 97% of what was caught by the Persane fleet in the Indian Ocean uh, when fishing on uh, drifting fads were juvenile tuna that never had a chance to grow uh, out to a mature stage. Uh, and obviously that is um, has a huge impact on those coastal states that rely on this as a, as a source uh, of food and income. Can so I, I think when, when we look at tuna fisheries, for us, it is very important to look at the sustainable development goals, the need to look at sustainable development, understand that this is part of a process that's been agreed between uh, governments and 
is really the pathway to ensure that we can ultimately address ocean conservation as well. Uh, and in some cases, we see the business community actually directly, directly sort of undermining the sustainable development goals in some of the actions that they take. And I think that is part of what we really need to get into this debate okay, as well. I hope we can get on to that. Uh, just a quick question for Helena, and then I want to talk, talk about how the fish are caught, which you touched upon. Well, Helena, um, in Europe, is, it, is, is, is tuna mainly canned? Or, or I mean, what proportion is canned and what proportion is fresh? And I mean, we're not great. We Some of us like sushi, but we don't eat that much of it, do we? Yeah, so um, to the broad question, tuna is, um, it's caught globally as a great commodity. And in, in, like you said, most of it that we sell is canned. And it's a, it's an easy to store, good source of protein and is quite easily accessible. It's just a global, uh, globally available. So most of what we see is um, is canned, although we also sell steaks of frozen and uh, and chilled yellowfin mainly. So what goes, there's two different species, mainly what goes into kind of skipjack and then what goes into, into the steaks tends to be yellowfin. But what I wanted to mention as the conversation was flowing, it's a key thing and very basic point to get across is how the nature of the tuna fisheries happens mainly in international waters and the difficulties of this global of managing this global commodity. It needs to be by voluntarily agreed agreements between several dozens of, of countries and that's that tricky yeah. part behind that will come into I'm sure. We will. Uh, Camille, just tell us about how, how are, we've heard about um, pole and line catching or one to one uh, catching. Um, how how is most tuna caught? What 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 is a purse sainer, for example? I, I guess uh, the most most um, tuna is called by purse sainer. Purse sainer is essentially a large bag sized net um, where a vessel seals it out and encircles um, a, a school of tuna, pulls the net and then lifts the tuna on board, um, and that that's one of the typical ways of, of catching tuna and, and, and many other species actually it, it can occur at different scales you have speech stains as well which are persains too but they are they happen to be small are they, and persains are relatively new are they i mean in terms of the i don't think so i, I think persains okay. have been around for about 50 to 70 years depending on where you go um, actually the, the first nation that developed persaining for tuna was norway in the 1950s, and at that point, they they started um, to use persains, which they had used in their the herring fishery, to start catching uh, bluefin tuna in the North Atlantic, which was very abundant at that point in time. So, uh, funny enough, a North Atlantic state uh, pioneered now a gear that is very prominent in, in tropical tuna fisheries. But Alex, there's also long liners. I think. Um, I mean, I don't know what what what, what sort of proportion. Yeah. Is and what is a long liner? So a long liner. It's, 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 it sounds. Quite innocuous and very, you know. It's a, well, it's not. It's a, it's it's a you know it, it's a pretty harmful thing. It's a um you know it's a, it's a boat that they uh, set sometimes you know hundreds of miles sort of um you know as its name suggests long line a very very long one hundred uh, mile uh, line of monofilament uh, very very strong um, plastic uh, line and then off that there'll be like um, lots and lots of bait hooks. Um, at which they bait with squid, and then it catches not only tuna, but it catches sharks, turtles, seabirds, all kinds of um, you know other billfish, lots of different kinds of bycatch. So it's a very indiscriminate um, way of fishing. Um, there has been some uh, progress with different kinds of hooks, like round ones that don't sort of uh, cause as much trouble. But uh, in general, the, especially the the Taiwanese fishing fleet, they're very very destructive and um, hundred 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 mile long lines i mean that's a i think that's a i'm not sure what the longest one is generally it's like 50 kilometers 100 kilometers 100 miles i'm, I'm not what's sure that? exactly the length what's, they're, what's they're a, really they put them out during the day and then come collected at night what's a, what's dolphin friendly tuna then is that is that is that caught by long lines or or you know you see these labels on cans saying <laughs> dolphin friendly that's mainly related to to persainers again. So tuna, they're hunter fit hunters fishing fish fish. Sorry, and they tend to swim. Dolphins tend to swim together with tuna sometimes, hunting in 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 kind of a strategic way. And therefore, um, dolphins are quite visual for captains and boats. They can see them quite quickly, and they know that if they set around dolphins, they they're likely going to catch tuna. Um, 
And that's mainly what they, those are called dolphin sets and what dolphin tuna cans, you know, the dolphin friendly ones are that we don't allow. I and mean, we don't allow in Tesco sets around dolphins. Nowadays that, that has improved. Now they lower the, the nets um, and let the dolphin out. Whereas I think in the past was much worse, uh, but there's still that um, pressure on the dolphins and stress, unnecessary stress really. Camille, is the, is the global tuna catch still growing? As far as, yeah, I think the global tuna catch has continued to grow remarkably, um, mainly because of an increased catch of, of skipjack. Skipjack as a stock or as stocks in the three oceans are, are doing quite well. Um, it, it's a, a resilient animal. They are very young, sexually mature. They can um, re repopulate or, or spawn year round. And so they're quite resilient to high fishing pressure. Alex, um, so for just, yeah, just, well. Alex, just by contrast, I know you talk, talked about shark as a bycatch, but Camille's just said that um, you know the tuna can uh, reproduce very quickly. Whereas the case of sharks, in some cases, a mako shark, for example, it can be twenty years before a shark breeds. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, and that's, and it's also this case for yellowfin tuna. Um, they, you know, they can't breed fast enough, and they're, they're um, catching the a lot of the, the persane. Uh, per se, fishing fleet are catching the juveniles, which is a big problem because that means they can't breed. And so then the, that's why the population of yellowfin tuna is crashing. And that's oh. all because of these drifting fads that the per se has used, which, which we're calling for a, a total global ban on. We'll come back to that. So, so that's the difference, Camille, is it, um, between the two, between the different types of tuna? It's, the, it's how quick the, I mean, the, the yellowfin is potentially more vulnerable because it's slower to breed. I think not only yellowfin, I, I think also big eye or bluefin, they're slower growers, later maturers than the skipjack. So you need oh, yeah. to, to be more careful in, in, in how you exploit those stocks. And in certain cases, uh, the, the stocks for yellowfin are not in good shape. Indian Ocean has been mentioned as an example, but other longer lived, um, bigger grown tuna species, you know, certain bluefin, Pacific bluefin are also in, in, in poor health from a stock perspective. So. Yeah, I mean, especially with these bigger, longer-lived animals, you have to be more precautionary in how you exploit them. So, okay, quick fire round. Are we, uh, to all, all of you, are we, uh, do we have a real problem here? I mean, are the stocks sustainable or are we, are, are we putting the stocks at, at risk by carrying on the way we are doing at the moment? Martin? I, <laughs> I certainly think so, think so Chris. Uh, the stocks are at risk. Uh, and again, just emphasizing, I think we need to see tuna fisheries in the context of ocean conservation, uh, impacts on biodiversity, you know, climate change is, is a huge uh, impact potentially on tuna fisheries, the coastal communities, small island developing states, all these things need to be considered. And the trend we see uh, is increased industrialization of tuna fisheries, increased uh, using of harmful uh, gear types like drifting fads, the impacts are huge. It's not only associated with uh, juvenile bycatches of uh, both big eye and uh, and yellowfin tuna. And incidentally, big eye tuna is overfished in the Atlantic as well. So it is an ongoing problem. Uh, but drifting fads at the moment operate in a completely non-transparent way in that the uh, the owners of, of those drifting feds take no responsibility for, for the impacts. And I want, I'm it, def I'm it relates to ghost fishing and uh, impacts on corals and a whole range of things. Um, thank you, Martin. I'm definitely coming back to, to, to fads um, and to explain what they are. Uh, Helena, from the retail side, I mean, is the retail industry concerned about the long term sustainability of tuna? Yes, definitely. And I think that's something that we've seen a big response from a lot of retailers recently. We've created the Global Tuna Alliance to bring the market voice to the table. And even though it's relatively new, I think we're starting to shift and shake the, the current status quo. Status cool. So it's it's good to see. And and just to make, if I may, just to make go back to the point that I said of the complexity of managing and the fact they're international waters, um, there's a need for a robust high sea treaty and that's something that it's it's coming so therefore very important for advocacy around that and making sure that the market is also interested to see that happening to ensure that it helps managing tuna fisheries as well. <clears throat> and Alex are you worried about uh, the shark the, the tuna as well as the shark bycatch? Yes I mean it's all it's all one isn't it we're talking about uh, biodiversity as a whole 
Um, we've seen how um, during the pandemic, um, um, I think um, Camille mentioned that the, the the amount of tuna is going is being caught is going up because that's to satisfy uh, the demand for canned tuna. You know, we saw people stockpiling toilet rolls. Uh, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, but they're also grabbing lots of tuna off the shelf because it's a it's a long lasting um, you know long shelf life. People can stock up and. Um, and so the pandemic has, has certainly uh, driven the sales in tuna. So the tuna industry have done very well out of the out of the pandemic. Um, but you know, as as I've said before, it's um, it's sharks, it's tuna, it's turtles, it's all of these things. We're looking at it in a holistic way. Um, we're not a sort of one species organisation. Um, certainly, when I lived in Hong Kong, I was working for many years to get the Hong Kong government to ban the ivory trade, which we succeeded in doing. And during that time, it brought me into um, close contact with a lot of the issues surrounding the illegal wildlife trade. Um, UNODC have, have said that, um, you know, within the fishery sector, crime is very rife. You know, we're talking about money laundering. We're talking about uh, smuggling of arms and drugs and um, people trafficking. We haven't even touched on human rights yet. So the whole tuna industry is rife with, you know, it's a huge range of problems. And we're just saying, you know, we think that globally we should just put the brakes on this thing and just look, see where we are. Okay, see that some uh, populations of tuna, uh, you know, they said we can manage it up to the maximum sustainable yield, but that doesn't take into account the criminals, or at least the, org you know, not necessarily organized crime, but, but organized criminal activity. People stealing, there's, fru there's fraud, there's mislabeling, there's all this stuff that's going on in the background, and the scientists can't model for that stuff, because, and it just undermines the whole thing. So we're just saying, you know, right now, we just advise people not to. Um, to buy any uh, tuna caught with fads at all and to be very, very careful. And if they're in the supermarket, only buy uh, Poland line caught tuna. Okay, well, again, we'll come back. I promise you, we'll come, <laughs> we'll come back to <laughs> we'll come back to fads. Camille, tell us, um, how is the how are the tuna stocks supposed to be managed? How did governments come together well, to, to try and, you know, come to some arrangement? Yeah, I mean, first, maybe to 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 echo what was said, uh, that, that we are also concerned about um, tuna stocks and especially those that are subject to overfishing. But that, that concern goes beyond just um, overfishing. Um, you know, with a global population that is growing, um, we do need to look at future food availability and um, you know, low impact animal proteins, wild seafood, um, are part of a, a global diet uh, going forward. And stocks like skipjack, in the Western Central Pacific or the Indian Ocean or in the Atlantic may still be in an okay shape now. But if no management is in place where that, that stock is shared across states and where decision rules are adopted by regional fisheries management organizations that predefine how catches will be cut if stocks hit certain thresholds, so if the stock goes below a certain level, then there should be an automatic management response reducing the catch to allow stock for recovery. So that Harvest control rule and uh, harvest strategy in every single tuna regional fisheries management organization is going, going to be critical going forward to, to sustain tuna fisheries into the future because the models will continue to rise. Well, let, let, let me let me I'm going to bring Martin in, but uh, but the management is supposed to be done by by regional fisheries management organizations. It's the RFMOs. That's the governments coming together at conferences and I don't know. I suppose they come together once a year or maybe maybe they're liaising daily. And they're supposed to be setting, you know, man managing the stocks, aren't they? Now, Martin's pointed out that the coastal states, if you like, they're the indigenous people. They, they need to meet their own needs. And they, they certainly probably have a, a moral right to, uh, to to fish in their own seas. And, and yet the tuna is often caught in the high seas, which is international international waters. I just want, I mean, when, when Martin says the coastal states should have priority, how does that fit in? Because ultimately, if... if it doesn't really matter who has priority. If the, if, the, if the tuna is being overfished, it's being overfished. It doesn't matter who's doing the overfishing. Is that, I mean, is that a fair point to make? Okay. <laughs> I, I can yes. maybe just jump in on that uh, point as well, Chris. Um, if we look at the development of tuna fisheries, uh, the industrialization of tuna fisheries um, came about in the 1950s, as Camille said, primarily the uh, development of longline fisheries, the Korean. Japan were, were big in longline fisheries. Uh, the per se uh, uh, fisheries developed a bit later in the 70s and 80s. 
Uh, so they are relatively new. Before that, we didn't have any problems with overfishing. I mean, we are living in a different world. We have uh, demand has increased hugely. Uh, but we need to also understand that, you know, at some stage, these coastal states were happily living off these uh, tuna resources, looking after it, uh, until uh, industrial fleets started uh, developing. And that's why, you know, for us, we're very concerned about this trend. Uh, and often that trend is also driven by a procurement from the market, uh, increased industrialization of supply. Uh, uh, and in, in many cases, this is uh, uh, done on the back of harmful fishery subsidies. There's a huge focus around uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, abolishment of harmful fishery subsidies. But many of the fisheries that supply retailers that say they are responsible uh, are actually have actually been built up on the on the back of these uh, harmful subsidies. Well, when you raise the issue of subsidies, I mean, I suppose you also are, are raising the issue of, of, of which governments actually recognise that sustainability is a is a priority. Because you know, if you're paying out harmful subsidies, you're potentially exhausting the exhausting the stocks. Martin, you 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 uh, you're you're, uh, you're brave enough to speak out. I mean, which are the good governments and which are the bad governments when it comes to <laughs> sustainability issues? Well, we can start with the bad actors. Uh, uh, if you look, there's something called the uh, IUU Global Index that looks at the uh, the sort of reputation of uh, countries in terms of IUU fishing. Right at the top is China, and uh, directly underneath them is uh, um, Taiwan. Then a bit further down the list is uh, Korea. So many of these countries are also involved in per se and longline fisheries in the Pacific. Uh, on the back of, again, harmful subsidies, many of these fisheries have been built up. Uh, and many of these fisheries are also associated with uh, serious human rights abuses, right at the top in terms of human rights abuses, modern day slavery out at sea are China and, uh, and Taiwan. Now, if we look on the good actor side, obviously I will say the countries that uh, are fishing more responsibly and uh, uh, and in in my experience, it's those uh, coastal states that are, are, you know, not all coastal states are responsible. Not all small scale fisheries are sustainable. But the there's Europe, certainly the uh, amazing work has been done by some of the coastal states in the Indian Ocean. The Maldives, Kenya, uh, South Africa have been driving the agenda in terms of conservation at, uh, uh, at ICAT and IOTC. Brazil is another country that's hugely responsible in terms of their responsibilities at, at, at ICAT. So there's certainly some good actors within that RFMO space. I think the European Union might argue that some of the coastal states, despite, if you like, the, the moral arguments they have in their favour, are, are sometimes ob you know, obstructive when it comes to setting firm rules for everyone at the RFM. So tell me though, let, let me turn to Alex and just on the NGO issue generally. Um, Martin's just mentioned China, for example. I mean, NGO campaigning raises awareness in Britain and Europe and perhaps the States and, and, and the like. But, uh, you know, NGOs effectively aren't allowed to operate in China. I mean, you just, uh, so, so, so. They uh, are. Well, they, they are. Yeah, well, of course, you, of course you have, you have lots, lots of experience in Hong Kong. So, you're the right person to talk to. No, in, in Wild Day, we've had an office in China for many years. Um, you know, there's a lot of lot of staff working there. Um, we have staff working in a lot of different countries around the world in, in Africa um, and, it, and in Asia, mostly so it's on the supply side and the demand side. But, but uh, you know, China has an NGO law and um, like uh, uh, are, most countries, people have to operate within the law. And so, but are you yeah. getting are, are you getting through to the politicians? I mean, clearly, if they're yeah, if they're paying out harmful subsidies, and we all hear about the huge Chinese fishing fleets going and sweeping the seas, you know, do, do, are you getting through to the people that matter? Um, we haven't engaged with the Chinese government on that at all at the moment. Uh, there's other NGOs that are doing that, um, so we're working mostly on um, reducing demand uh, in China for. Uh, shark fin and uh, pangolin scales, rhino horn, ivory, um, and we've we, you know we've had some quite good success on on um, helping the Chinese government to bring in the ivory ban back in 2015, and now we're sort of trying to fix the uh, traditional Chinese medicine problem in China. Um, but you know, but these are issues that are beyond the uh, marine space. Uh, but like I said, it's it's all related. Uh, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's more about trying to get people to to stop. 
uh, buying these things, these environmentally destructive um, endangered species, of which um, yellowfin is sadly being added to the list. I, I uh, we're, we're more than halfway through uh, our discussion now, so just let me uh, take a brief pause and say thank you to everyone who's watching and thank you to those participating. Here is uh, Martin Purvis, the Managing Director of the International Pole and Lion Foundation, Helena Delgado Nordman, Sustainable Resources Manager for Tesco, Camille Derricks from the Marine Stewardship Council and uh, Alex Hofford from WildAid. So thank you all. And of course, we are discussing the future of tuna and uh, the issue of how we ensure that stocks are sustainable. Now, back to the panel. Uh, you have all raised fads. So Alex, tell us what a fad is. Well, in essence, a fad is a what's called a fish aggregating device. And that, as the name suggests, is something that aggregates fish underneath it. Right, so it's, it's usually just a, a bunch of um, like, a, so basically a raft, sometimes made out of um, organic materials, but also some plastic. Sometimes they use uh, metal to tether stuff together with uh, fishing buoys uh, on, tied onto it to keep it afloat. And then beneath it, it'll have um, uh, you know, sometimes up to 50 meters of ribbons or ropes, or fishing ropes or fishing nets. Um, and these things, you know, yeah, thank you. and they attract all kinds of marine life. So, so they can, uh, small fish, big fish, um, turtles, sharks, tuna, um, whale sharks, even um, everything. So it becomes like a little mini um, ecosystem unto itself. And so and the, the, um, the and also is... attached to it is attached to it. There is always a satellite buoy, so it can be easily located in, in the vast expanses of the ocean. Um, and the the satellite buoy just um, sends a, a message to the to the fishing boat where it is, and then um, the, the the fishing boats will go there, and they'll set a giant uh, net around it. And as its name suggests, it's like a purse. And it's got a drawstring, and so that as the net closes in, it just gets everything. It's very very indiscriminate way of, um, of, of fishing because it just scoops up everything. Um, I, I've actually spent some time on Persainers and Longliners in, in the Pacific um, doing some work for another organization and I've seen how firsthand how awful these things are and that's why we're calling for them to be completely banned. Yeah so so Martin um, to add to that I mean what's your concern about fads or the lack of regulation of fads? <laughs> Yes, it's the uh, lack of regulation. I mentioned in the beginning uh, um, of the debate that I spent a lot of time out at sea in many different types of uh, uh, fisheries, many different types of uh, vessels, you know, longliners, trawlers, uh, pollen line vessels. And to me, the way persainers operate with their drifting feds is probably the most transparent, uh, non-transparent fisheries I've come across because the uh, the information of where the drifting fads are is not shared with fishery managers uh, and the owners of those drifting fads take absolutely no responsibility for any of those impacts. So, you know, a study in the in the uh, Pacific, for instance, uh, a fishery called the, the party, party to the Nauru Agreement, the PNA fishery, did a study and, uh, and found that uh, only 13% of the fads that were deployed and we're talking about thousands of uh, these devices being deployed were actually retrieved so only 13 percent were retrieved the rest uh, beached uh, caused ongoing damage in the environment um, you know interesting statistic there was that every year around uh, 2.8 square kilometers of coral reef is damaged permanently by these devices and the netting underneath them so there's a climate change impact, but you know there's there's also the uh, uh, contribution to uh, uh, plastic marine pl plastic pollution. Uh, a lot of netting, uh, Alex mentioned. Sometimes it's actually up to 100 meters of netting hanging underneath these fads, uh, and that uh, remains in the environment and continues to ghost fish uh, and continues to have huge uh, uh, impacts on the ecosystem. Ghost fishing, yes. Um, um, ghost fishing is. Uh... Well, when, when, the, when the fishing activity is not actively taking place, but the fish are still being caught and therefore dying in the in nets. Yeah. Um, well, right. Let me just ask about the Marine Stewardship Council. I mean, when you take into account when you're certifying tuna fishing, do you take into account whether they're using fads or whether the fads are being regulated in any in any sense? 
Oh yes, of course. <laughs> so, 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 how do you do this? Because clearly, the, the 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 regional fisheries management organisations don't seem to be doing so properly, if at all. Well, I, I guess the the key things that fisheries are assessed against um, in a public evaluation by expert auditors with any stakeholder looking over the shoulder with a peer review taking place is that first of all, stocks need to be healthy. So you need to have a good biomass. You need to have measures in place make sure that that stays that way. The other things that are evaluated are, what is the ecosystem impact of a specific fishery? So it depends on the gear, depends on where the gear is used, how the gear is used, and therefore what bycatch documentation exists, what um, interaction takes place with endangered threat of protected species, if that's well understood and if mitigation measures are taken. And then last but not least, if there's a good say, management system, is there monitoring, compliance and surveillance active on these fisheries that want to be meeting the MSC standard? So every fishery around the world that is certified has been held against that standard in a transparent fashion in the same way. It's fair to say that about 50% of the fisheries that first want to get certified do a pre-assessment and then are not progressing to the MSC full assessment because they don't come through that sort of first filter. Once they go into the, the full assessment, 88% of fisheries make it through and 12% has units that fail. Most fisheries, 94% of everything that's certified gets homework assignments. There are still issues they need to work on. Um, and so if there's a fishery that, that still has an issue with a particular bycatch or an interaction with an endangered threat to protect the species and information is poor, they need to collect the data, they need to become more transparent, and they need to do essentially a better job to maintain the certificate um, after five years if they want to do that. So I guess, it, yeah, that sums it up. Is it, okay, is it, uh, yeah. I, I, I want to know, I want to, I want to slowly, as we sort of move into the, the third, last third of the program, and to, to discuss, you know, what we need to do and what measures must be taken. Helena, um, I'm going to ask you about the new uh, sustainability strategy that's been adopted by by Tesco. But just tell me, what, what, how much consumer demand is there for change? I mean, is it just simply NGOs in Europe that kick up a big fuss and you know get publicity and put supermarkets under the under the spotlight, or act, do actually people make a choose the tuna they're going to buy or the supermarket they go to on the grounds of whether or not that supermarket is practicing sustainably? sustainable encouraging sustainable practices or not so a few things about this um first of all in the uk there is demand for sustainable tuna i think uh, that demand has never been greater we do get customer queries that get forwarded to me because they become more and more complex some of them race concerns about the rfmos you know technical things that you wouldn't expect um to get from a consumers but they actually there's interest growing basically from or perspective is Tesco. We want to create a um, a shopping experience that the consumer doesn't have to be concerned about their choice when they come in to shop in Tesco in terms of marine sustainability. And that's my job, and that's what we're trying to do. And with the new um, approach that we're taking, well, the basis of the approach is moving towards seascape, which means taking a more holistic approach to sourcing and managing fisheries. And for that to happen, we need all stakeholders to play the role. And this means a big part of this behind all, all the plan is management correctly all gear types in an area and having uh, best practice in place, um, including MPAs, um, including um, all these things that we're talking in. And, and this also includes fat management. And in terms of fat management, um, we, as part of the GTA, is one is within our five year strategy and we've created um, best practices document. There's it's called best practices document on how to manage um, fat fisheries and that's I refer to that document with all, the, with all the things that we need to see in terms of improvements but definitely going forward we need to see that more holistic approach because there's more than one gear type actioning and we need to have um, flexibility and collaboration from the government and the industry to work together towards um, sustainable tuna fisheries. And you but tuna's uh... Apologies, a Tesco strategy. I think eight years ago you were saying you were only going to buy pole and line caught tuna, but yes. now now you're saying now you've moved to say we're well, we're going to only catch we're only gonna, we're going to move only sell under your own brand um, MSC certified tuna, which may be pole and line or or, or not. And why why are you not able to 
hunt, guarantee Poland Lion, for example? So the the approach we took um, several years ago, it, there was a shift in the whole of the UK market towards a gear based approach. And that's what we're trying to transition because we've seen that uh, single based uh, approaches having on, on gear haven't managed to solve all the issues that we see in tuna. And we understand that we need to work with uh, big players in the industry, such as the per or the catch 65 percent of the global catch. And as a global retailer, the volumes that we require, uh, we want sustainability credentials and we need uh, we want to work with a broader spectrum um, and have this holistic approach and require you're, sustainability. You're saying there's a bit one of the big supermarkets you said you couldn't get enough pole and line tuna to, to meet your demands or perhaps not the price because you know you're not a, you're, you, you don't sell on the basis of you don't you don't sell a, 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 at the luxury end of the market. Yeah, so what, something that we always refer to is we're trying to deliver, and our aim is to deliver healthy, sustainable diets, affordable for all. So that affordable for all part is very key. We try to mainstream sustainability, and, and that's the nature of sustainability. It needs to be global, otherwise it's not sustainable. And that's what we're trying to do, and also the basis of the, the way that we work. This should be good news for you, Martin, isn't it? I mean, it's good news that... Uh... Um, pole and line fishers can't meet the demands of the big supermarkets because their volumes are so large. That that must mean there's a huge amount of demand for your, uh, you know, for your members. Well, yes. Well, I wouldn't quite uh, uh, agree with that statement that there's uh, um, not enough. Uh, you know that the su supply doesn't um, outrun or the supply outruns the the demand. W what uh, is different is, you know, if there's a real sort of ethical choice on what is the most sustainable product, in my mind, one by one tuna fisheries uh, are the most sustainable, whether they are MSC certified or not. And we also have to uh, recognize that many of the MSC certified fisheries use uh, these fads that we talked about. Uh, there's still a lack of uh, uh, transparency in how these fads actually operate and then many of these uh, fisheries have also been built on the back of harmful fishery subsidies now the msc is an environmental standard and uh, and uh, you know doesn't look at uh, human rights issues there's there's some aspects of that that is included in the msc standard uh, but as i said many of these tuna fisheries are also connected to modern day slavery practices so there's really a bit more due diligence needed from the market side than saying I come out to source everything from MSE certified products because that really uh, can drive things in our mind in the wrong direction when it comes to ocean conservation, when it comes to sustainable development, uh, and ultimately uh, have a huge impact on livelihoods of uh, coastal communities. Thank you. Camille, you want to come back in? Yeah, I, I want to want to come in um, on several things. First of all, congratulating Tesco with its strong, say, procurement ambition of sustainable tuna. Um, I think you know it is very important that we don't mix up gear and sustainability performance. Gear has a relation to sustainability performance, but doesn't dictate it. You can use a fat operation in a way that it has limited and and low impact and you can make sure that that is properly documented well managed from a healthy stock you can also see smaller scale operations be very destructive if you have thousands of small vessels operating on say anchored fats around reefs where they have a lot of juvenile they buy catch as well or where they have their anchoring operations in areas that are destroyed by that on stocks that are not well managed or sustainable then that's not sustainable either so we should not mix up scale with sustainability or gear with sustainability. I do agree that these smaller scale operations, for instance, Pone Online small scale operations, have a lot of traits that make them attractive and would typically enable them to meet sustainability standards like the MSC somewhat easier if they have a healthy stock, if there's good management in place. But it's, it's, so, it's very important to have that a distinction that sustainability is not mixed up with gears, because ultimately sustainability is about impact. Helena, I want to see. I'm sorry, I'm expressing a personal preference here, but uh, then I'm, you know, I'm a former fisheries politician. I want to see sustainable fishing, and you know, I want the political will uh, to be exercised by governments across the world to, to bring this about. It seems to me that the retailers collectively, you know, you, you have enormous force for, for for opportunity to bring about improvement, but maybe I'm just 
I just talk to the good supermarkets and they, 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 you know, there must be loads of supermarket chains out there across the world that really aren't getting a, uh, aren't giving a fig about sustainability issues. I mean, how do you how do you do you, do you simply work with the good or do you try and persuade the bad as well? No, it's a good question. We we try to work with all for for sure. It's um, it, it's it's a delicate situation, and we try to to find the leverage the best we can with with some of the retailers that we have less access. You know, they we're competitors in some areas, and therefore we have more relationships. And for example, in the UK, there's very great relationship with all three retailers. Um, when we think about more globally, we're starting to see more interest from different markets. I think, I think, for example, the um, the Olympics brought more attention to sustainability in 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 Asia, and we've seen a bit of of interest there and and collaboration in some of these uh, groups that we work together. So um, I think more to come, and I think consumer consumer request on that on that topic can also help as well as NGOs, of course. But and what about, what about and, and um, Camille, maybe bring you in, what about the seafood companies? I mean, okay, you know, the, the people who are actually, these big names, and I've talked to Thai Union and the like before, we know their brands, but we, but no one ever hit, no, no one ever campaigns against the companies because no one's ever heard of these companies. And yet, you know, the big Japanese have got, a, companies, seafood companies have got a turnover of eight or nine billion dollars. These have huge influence on, on the market. I mean, absolutely. How do we, how do we, how do we get them properly engaged in in ensuring they're putting in place the right policies for the fishermen they're employing? Camille, okay. It's a very, very good point. I, I think um, collaboration was mentioned by Martin, and and you know, big retailers, um, even big retailers like Tesco, are only a very small part of global tuna demand. So there's thousands of retailers and brands, and a lot of different large vertically operated, um, operated um, fishing companies. So if you talk about Taiyuan or say the top 20 global seafood companies, seven being Japanese, these need to, in, in, in my view, um, be become even more strict in, in how they manage their procurements. They um, can ask for sustainable seafood. They can verify that through meeting the MSC standard. And even if that standard is not going far enough for some, that is going to help to drive progress at RFMO level if these companies knock on the door of the decision makers, ultimately and the delegations of the national states that together vote on resolutions at the RFMO levels. So I, I think it's a very good point and, and many of these large companies can do can do more, frankly. Helena, but, and then I'd just Martin, like to, oh, can I, can right. I just have, yeah. say a word? Yeah, so, you know, I'd just like to, you know, congratulate Tesco on your Seascape policy that, you know, that's, it's definitely good that, um, that you're actually working on the issue. I mean, there are a lot of companies that don't even look at it. So that is amazing in itself. And, you know, we encourage you to, to take things a step further as well. Um, one thing that's slightly alarming is that you still continue to sell Prince's and John West tuna, which continue to source their tuna from um, highly destructive fads in the Indian Ocean. Um, that's a big problem for us. There's, uh, you know, they're in a uh, what's called a FIP fishery improvement um, project, and that FIP's notorious um, for using whale sharks on their um, on their fads. Um, you know, it's all out there. You can have a look at it on the fishery improvement um, progress website. It's all there publicly available. Um, so, you know, whilst we, you know, congratulate you on uh, having the Tesco own brand is fad free, um, would encourage you to sort of drop princes and and um, drop John West tuna until they can uh, start behaving themselves and likewise the MSC really shouldn't be certifying any new fad fisheries certainly there's there's pretty dodgy ones coming up in the western pacific and also in the eastern pacific you know the Galapagos islands where these drifting fads are washing up on the Galapagos that's something that was highlighted to me just last week which I had no idea about and also um, the MSC is going to be trying to look to certify um, the, the notorious um, Japan sharks uh, fishery, the blue sharks, um, which is an absolute disaster. I, I, I personally visited Kesanuma back back in the day and just I saw the you know, mounds and mounds and mounds and mounds of blue sharks. And there's no way you can ever convince me that that is sustainable. Okay, um, just to, so, yeah, bring okay. in here later. Please. Yeah, so to answer the, the first one, and then I got to, to Alex, in terms of the, the work that other brands um, do, there's a massive, um, this isn't, 
very big role from the supply chain. And I have to highlight the great work that a lot of our suppliers and especially a few of the supplier partners do. Uh, for example, Korea, we've seen a lot of improvement in, in, in Korea and in, in that is that is strongly related to the relationship building, working with the supply chain, explaining issues, understanding what we want to see. And even if the UK is a small part of, of that take uh, from some of the stakeholders that we that we work with, it's great to see that, that sustainability and also human rights uh, issues are becoming more on top of the agenda for, for key players. In terms of uh, what you said, Alex, um, so we, it's very important for us to work with big brands like Princess and, and Thai Union. There is a lot of improvement that we that we need to see in the water, and we we work closely with them. We have regular catch ups and and we share what we need to see. Uh, but we we see the importance that of the things that they do. They're asking the right questions. They have they have very um, they have very good uh, connections and, and relationship that they can and they are trying to influence for the better. So we see that very key aspects of them and that's why we continue to work with them. We ensure that what um, that what they're doing is aligned with what we're doing and, and we keep pushing for more. So there's this that balance um, that we we need to find and, and that relates to the way that we source as well. As you as you know, we've moved away from the Indian Ocean for a label because we we've saw that that balance for us wasn't there anymore in terms of progress and, and staying there. Um, so similar thing it, applies. It might to provide brands. more of an incentive to them. If you stop sourcing from them, then they'd actually pay attention and like, oh, Tesco's dropped our product, we better improve our game. Um, so there's also like a carrot and stick approach. Can I, yeah, can, I, can, I, can I just ask a, a, thought, a thought before this uh, discussion started? I just wondered why aren't some of us, some of those involved in the, the political game still, pressing for legislation at a national or European level to simply say, you know, we will not sell tuna unless it comes from a sustainable source as certified by a body approved by the commission or by a national government. I mean, why aren't we just why why aren't why isn't the political will there to 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 force through change? Why are we having to that's, rely upon individual supermarkets? At the, for example, to at the EU level, the answer is very simple: is that the Spanish um, and the French and the Italian fisheries wield a huge amount of power, and no matter what's coming out of DG Environment in Brussels, DG Mare just bucks that completely, and DG Mare are just basically acting as a sort of um, you know as a front for the industry. So the Spanish fishermen are extremely powerful. I, well, I, I, I accept that they are extremely powerful. And of course, they have the largest fleet in, in, in Europe. But uh, it's not always been my experience that they are as powerful as, as, as you may think. And I think well, DG, 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 Mar it. I think Mary has gone through quite a transformation over the past uh, few years and put sustainability much higher to its core. There you are. Those, those working for the European Commission who are watching this, you've just heard me, uh, heard me defend you. Uh, Camille. Well, I, I was going to echo that. I, I think, um, yes, uh, European vessels and, and the European Commission, for that matter, you know, need to keep pressing forward. But if you look at the voting records at the IOTC or any other RFMO, and you look at what resolutions have been suggested and um, what measures have been taken and what ready regulation the European flag vessels are subject to based on EU law, that is far better than a lot of other fleets operating in the area, I'm not even speaking about the um, Iranian gill netters or, sorry to say, a lot of the data deficient artisanal operations that are absolutely not recording what is caught and what interactions are taking place. And so have a long way to go to demonstrate the sustainability. So yes, Europe needs to do better, but Europe is also knowing that and trying to do something about it. That, that's for me already a very good start. Camille, thank yeah, you. That's we not have, the case in the IOTC last week though, is it? Okay. We're, I'm going to cut you off um, because I'm looking at the time, uh, Alex. And we're having a, a, a huge number of questions uh, um, s s sent in, which we'll try and address uh, as many as we can, but also perhaps to continue some of this discussion, because I still want to look, explore a bit about, uh, uh, you know, what more steps could we be taking to bring about improvement. But before I finish the, the, the formal part of our discussion, let me turn to, to Martin. Martin, on your, on your list of things you would most like to, you regard as the, as the number one priorities, do have a last say on this. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank, thank you, uh, Chris. Um, from our perspective, you know, as an organization, we uh, work with the business community. We want to see uh, that interaction 
with the business community drive uh, sustainable practices on the water. We work with fishermen uh, at the uh, fisherman level. Uh, I think, as I said before, there's a lot that still needs to happen. And uh, Elena mentioned uh, the uh, issue around gear neutrality. Now, this is a, 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 a something that I think is causing a lot of the problems. The idea uh, that all gears have the same sort of impacts and, uh, and ultimately uh, consumers are told that as long as it carries uh, a logo of a private standard like the MSC, uh, that it is uh, actually sustainable, um, uh, it can create a lot of this inequity in the ocean economy that we are seeing happening. You know, there are instruments, international instruments, that look at uh, uh, the need to look after um, small scale fisheries, uh, the sustainable development goals specifically mention the need for small-scale fisheries to be given priority when it uh, comes to market access and fishing opportunities. Many organizations say they are fully aligned with the sustainable development goals, but when you actually start looking at seafood procurement, a lot of what's happening at the moment is actually driving uh, sustainable development in the wrong direction. So we would really like to see uh, a lot more alignment with the sustainable development goals coming from the, the retail sector, coming from private standards like the MSC. Uh, and, you know, if that is our, our framework for really looking after the oceans and driving ocean conservation, then we can all work together. But we can't, uh, it makes it very difficult if we're living in uh, alternative realities of what sustainability uh, should look like. Well, thank you all. We've already covered a, a lot of ground, uh, but there's just so many issues that we haven't uh, explored in any depth yet. Uh, we are going to continue and look at some of the questions that have been sent in at the same time. But for those who have to leave now after after an hour's discussion, can I just thank our, our guests here? That's Martin Purvis, the Managing Director of the International Pole and Line Federation. Uh, Helena Delgado Nordman, the Sustainable Resources Manager from Tesco. Uh, Alex uh, Hofford from WildAid and Camille Derricks from the Marine Stewardship Council. Now, this uh, this webinar is organised by, by Rud Pedersen Public Affairs in Brussels, and uh, although sponsored today by uh, International Pole and Line Federation, for which I give thanks, uh, and it's available for replay or will be by tomorrow afternoon or some such on a website called Political Festival. Political Festival, you'll find uh, both this uh, repeat of this uh, discussion and the previous ones we had, including the last discussion I had about Brexit with the Director General of DG Murray and the European Commission. Right, okay, people. Um, so that's the end of our formal battering around, but we're going to look at some of the questions and continue raising some of these issues. But uh, those of you who are watching, you know, you can also take a moment off and grab a cup of coffee and such like for the last uh, 25 minutes or so that we're here. Um, uh, well, let's let's start off with Marine Stewardship Council because I can see a, a number of questions have, have, uh, have come in here. I, I And they're critical of various MSE practices, Camille. Um, I think you can regard this, of course, as, as flattery. It suggests that MSE is held up as the gold standard. I mean, there is no one quite like you doing the job you are. Um, and uh, people are disappointed sometimes that you, you, your, your image is more tarnished than they would like it to be. You know, they want to be able to hold you up and, and have something in this difficult environment we're facing of so many bad practices where they can really hold you up and, and say, you know, you are, you, you are the, uh, the token of greatness. So when it comes, for example, to certifying fisheries which are using fads, or uh, certifying fisheries where, you know, I mean, do you do this? And what account do you, how, do you how, how does MSC make these judgments where environmentalists would say, well, that's simply bad practice? Yeah. Well, maybe maybe first back to, you know, there's a lot of expectations on the MSC and it's indeed um, great that, that so many stakeholders care. And so we welcome stakeholders in our standard setting process, in our governance, in the assessments against standards by third party auditors, stakeholders are very welcome. So that, that first of all, we, we really care about these stakeholder voices and we actually make a continuous improvement in our standards and um, in the way in which this program operates. And it has led to a lot of, I think, changes in our standards over time and the impacts therefore have improved. So first, I guess I wanna say thanks to all those critical stakeholders that are engaged. 
Um, you know, I said it earlier about, say, 85% of global fisheries is not meeting the MSC standard. That's where the vast majority of the real big problems occur. In tuna, there's a little bit more engaged, but still 75% of the tuna fisheries are not certified. We're talking about IUU. We're talking about a documentation and interactions with EPP mitigation, and then you turn into protected species. That's where the real big impacts are. MSC fisheries are by no means perfect, but they do hold in common that they've all been tested against a high best practice standard that moreover is continuously improving. So it, this is a program that drives impacts in the water. More than 1,750 impacts have been documented over the years and we are counting for more. It's been created as a collaborative effort where we across geographies, across stakeholder groups, and throughout the supply chain, use that standard to make a global incentive to improve fisheries management. And, and it works, despite all its imperfection. What about um, maybe Helene or, or, or Camille? Oh, oh, indeed, Martin. I mean, there's a suggestion here from Charles. Um, I'm not sure which Charles, but um, I can guess. Um, saying there should be different levels of sustainability i mean people should be able to and and this is going to affect the price maybe you know if you want if you want something which takes into account all the social factors that martin would have would have suggested from from one to one fishing if you know if if, if you want simply to be if you if you want simply to be ensuring that you're not overfishing then that that is one category and other matters uh, can be put into other different categories at the moment we're we're simply reliant are we not on on msc I mean, uh, Helena, that's what you're doing, isn't it? You're putting all your trust in, in MSC. You're not giving people a choice about the standard of certification they should be, uh, they, they can, they can uh, opt for. Not really. So um, we recognize, GSSI recognize certification. So MSC is the main, um, the most spread certification across the, the world but there are some others and um, in terms of tuna in our approach what we want to do is build on existing tools that we see as essential to drive change that we've seen like fisheries improvement projects which are, which are fantastic tools to drive change the MSC has driven so much change and, and it is a very easy um, tool that helps us um, is, is a standard, is a high standard that helps us communicate in an easy way with the consumer. And now what we want to see, engaging with the MSC to keep seeing them improve them like they are, um, is to see a bit more. We want, we're going to start benchmarking our supply chain on 100% observer coverage, um, all these all these measures that we're coming up with um, with our new approach. But yeah, I, in terms of having different levels of sustainability, it's a very tricky question. We 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 see, like I said earlier, mainstreaming sustainability. I don't think uh, someone that doesn't have the means as someone else should not be able to access sustainable seafood. So we want to see both sustainable in at the world or picture of the word, meaning human rights and and environmentally sustainable tuna coming through, and that's what we're working for. Um, Martin, come in. Um... Would you? Is there a separate standard for one-to-one uh, -one fishing, or, or would you like to see one? Well, let's just be clear: the the MSC standard is a is a private standard. Uh, it's not necessarily supported by uh, uh, everyone. In terms of that, is where the level of sustainability should sit. Um, and uh, uh, as I said previously, when we see things happening in the marketplace, for instance, we work with a uh, handline fisheries that are very sustainable, that uh, cannot afford certification, uh, almost no bycatch in those fisheries. No one will convince me that uh, sourcing from a certified longline fishery in the Pacific, uh, which has been built up on the back of harmful subsidies and where human rights abuses occur on a daily basis, is a more sustainable choice and drives things in a, in a sustainable direction. So I think what is needed is a bit more uh, 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 of in introspection from the buyer side, from the uh, market side, to uh, to understand things better and not just rely on one particular standard as the the benchmark for uh, um, uh, for what is a sustainable choice, because that really uh, drives things uh, in the wrong direction. 
just to answer that, if that's all right, uh, f speaking in this case, I guess, from a market perspective, the understanding is is definitely growing and the voice of the market is coming onto the table. And I'll refer again to the to the GTA five year strategy and how comprehensive that is and in, in, in all the de all the issues that we're trying to solve, because we understand that there's more tools in the box rather than just certification. Certification is a key step in the journey, but there's so much more that we need to do. And that's what we're trying to deliver. Camille? And then Martin. Yeah, I, I, I want to hook on to a couple of things. One is, if we're talking about sustainable development goals, um, and especially sustainable development goal number 14, life below the water, it has set out a number of targets that uh, the global community wants to meet. It wants to eradicate overfishing. It wants to see stock recovery at the levels where maximum sustainable yield can be produced. It wants to eradicate IUU fishing and harmful subsidies. The MSC program was recognized in the preparatory papers for SDG 14 as a tool that could help governments and companies to demonstrate progress against that SDG goal and the targets. Now, and that goes across scales. As I said, some smaller scale fisheries have inherent traits that make them easier to demonstrably uh, meet sustainability standards. But ultimately, if you talk about tuna, what underpins a sustainable artisanal fishery or a big scale fishery is a good management of the stock. And if that stock is not well managed and is deep disappearing, where small scale fisheries may also have bycatch of sensitive bait stocks, then there is a sustainability problem irrespective of scale. So I, I just want to bring that in. Um, can I, don't make that up. I'm looking at a question here from Jess Rattle, who said just put, you know, looking at the Indian Ocean and indeed. You know, I, I've heard many times there's a real threat to yellowfin tuna stocks, and there's a, a number of people say there's an imminent danger of, of complete collapse. But um, pointing out that uh, MSC certifies skipjack tuna in the Indian Ocean, but you're still, you know, the bycatch is yellowfin tuna, and the yellowfin tuna is potentially endangered. So, you know, I don't know how do you, I just don't know how you resolve these things. Perhaps you can help, Camille. Yeah, there are, there are say, two, if I'm not mistaken, fisheries that have been meeting the standard. One is the polar line fishery for the Maldives um, um, skipjack fishery, which has a, a bycatch of juvenile yellow fins around anchored fats. And then there is a person fishery from a company called Echebastar that also sets some free swimming pools. And they indeed, in the person operations that have fats, they have a bycatch of yellow fin as well. Now, both the Pono Line operation in the Maldives, as well as the operation in Spain or from Spain, they have a similar condition to meet. They need to ensure that that bycatch level of, of juvenile yellowfin is reduced. And ultimately, if that is not successful and, and the, the stock of yellowfin becomes at a, at a very low level, that can jeopardize their certificates in both cases. Just Martin, I'm, I'm looking at the question, by all means, make your own comments, but I'm looking at various questions and I'm struck by the number of questions which are either critical of MSC, although, you know, there is no one better than MSC, however <laughs> imperfect it may, may be, or they're critical of the European Commission and my ex or the European Union. And my experience is that although there is a, there are, of course, vested interests to protect, by and large, the European Commission is, is out there you know, arguing for sustainability and for, for standards, for, 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 for harvest control rules to be introduced and, and, and such like. Surely the big yeah. problem for us all is they, the 75% of tuna which are not being regulated in any sense at all, not even remotely. And, and that doesn't take account perhaps of all the illegal fishing. I mean, how do you as a, you know, your international Pole and Line Federation, how do you manage to engage with these governments which don't seem to want to get engaged? Because time is uh, running out. It's a, it's a very good point, and we certainly uh, engage quite widely where we can. Uh, in fact, we've engaged with countries like uh, Iran, for instance, and I think that is important where, you know, there's a lot of criticism potentially. Iran fishes with gill nets, causes impacts. Uh, that argument has actually been put forward by the, the uh, Spanish per se industry primarily, uh, and uh, it's a lot more effective to engage and see where we can uh, make change than you know, just criticizing from the sidelines. So we, for instance, looking at some of these gillnet fisheries uh, uh, and gear conversions, and, you know, it would be great to get the, the market to support some of these gear conversions where we introduce one, one by one tuna fishing gear, phase out uh, gillnets, 
uh, obviously address the uh, uh, harmful environmental impacts that these gears have, uh, and in the process also help the fishermen by producing better quality uh, tuna that can potentially access international markets. I think that is, for instance, a much better choice, a lot more responsible if the market invested in, in projects like those than supporting large industrial fisheries that continue to use uh, drafting feds in a non-transparent manner. Well, when you, when you say the market should be doing that, do you mean who? T Tesco's and their, 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 their like? Or, or? I don't want to point fingers to specific uh, retailers. And certainly we uh, work uh, with many uh, retailers, many brands, many uh, suppliers in the marketplace, also processors, fisher associations. Uh, so we are very involved in, uh, in working with the business community in the markets and uh, have had a lot of support uh, from those uh, International Colon Line uh, Foundation members for these type of projects where, you know, we look at improvements around uh, environmental sustainability, but also social responsibility in these fisheries. And I think that is, you know, really the way to go. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, uh, 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 I'm very familiar with the MSC. I used to uh, work for the MSC. Camille and I were, were colleagues. I set up the regional program in Africa for them. Uh, it is but one tool that can uh, uh, can drive sustainability. But the problem comes when uh, it becomes the only tool uh, and when uh, market actors make commitments to 100% sourcing from only certified fisheries, which immediately means small-scale fisheries are put at a, at a disadvantage. Elena mentioned the, the Global Tuna Alliance and their 2025 commitment. Uh, it, it uh, contains some very good elements. In fact, we were thinking of signing up to this commitment uh, until we saw in the fine print that part of that commitment is to make a, 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 a public pledge to only source from MSC certified uh, fisheries and fisheries in fisheries improvement projects that are ultimately geared towards MSC certification. We cannot sign up to something like that if it puts our small scale fisheries at a, at a disadvantage. So, you know, they, there's often uh, uh, different uh, initiatives all going to the same sort of uh, uh, in the same direction that uh, makes it very difficult uh, for, for us to be aligned. Thank you. Can you? And then... Uh, oh. gonna... Yeah, about, about small-scale fisheries, I think I said it at, the, um, at my opening statement. There's a lot of small-scale fisheries engaged in the MSC program. If you count the number of small-scale vessels and small-scale fishermen in the MSC program, those outnumber the number of larger-scale operations. Not in volume, but in terms of total participation, it's enormous. And so this program does not exclude, it actually helps small-scale fishermen in many cases to find their way into a market that is increasingly interested in sustainable seafood. If that is related to, say, Vietnamese cockles that now are on the shelf in, um, in various UK retailers, where small-scale hand-raking families enjoy market premiums and preferences that they didn't have before, have become better organized and cooperative, have better understanding of the impacts, are subject to a management plan. That's but one example of many of these small-scale fisheries in the program, and we facilitate access and help them forward. So I don't think we should speak about this as if big and small-scale are mutually ex exclusive, that can actually work very well together. But what underpins it, and what needs to underpin it, is proper fisheries management with proper harvest strategies and harvest control rules. That, that is the basis. Well, H Helena, if, just uh, picking up on that, take the Indian Ocean as an example. I mean, if we're just to ensure that uh, yellowfin tuna stocks survive, then we have to have proper um, a ha proper harvest controls, proper a proper strategy, and enforcement of the, of the rules and the like. And, and we know that we're not getting governmental support um, because it has to be done by consensus. We're just not getting the support for that that's, that's, uh, that's needed. I just wonder, you, you work in the Global Tuna Alliance. I mean, to, um, what degree of, of consultation and discussion and cooperation is there between governmental bodies, political decision makers, commission, national governments, India, whatever, and the, and the big retailers? I mean, are you working in isolation or because it seems to me that, you know, we've got to, there's got to be political will to bring about, about change and you know, that requires cooperation. Yeah, definitely. So what we're trying to do with the GTA, there's to that to answer your question, there is a lot of conversations and 
it's only been a year ago and what we're trying to do is increase those conversations we um through the gta we've had through the gta and then separately we have different engagement with the governments targetly individually but also public uh public announcements uh on advocacy and that's something that we need to see growing in in at to the broad question and what we need to see to going forward to improve tuna we definitely need to use the tools uh like the gta that's trying to bring that market voice into the table and and and, and mix the status quo is uh is to have more voices added to that so we need to see the global tuna alliance grow in and, and key players from other different areas of the world to join uh to join the voice and and join the targets and to answer um to martin's point earlier on 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 fips and msc <clears throat> the just to emphasize the importance of FIP and, and not only to achieve MSC for us as a, as a big retailer, they represent a fantastic tool of information and, and advocacy. So these guys, the Fisheries Improvement Project gathers the key stakeholders of the fishery that have a massive voice in the area to drive change. But also for me, when I do my job, it bring it gathers all the information that I actually need to understand how the fishery is is doing. And so it, the stock assessments, the the how, what they're doing on 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 how they're managing the gear, if they have best practices in place, or, or and if they not, they create those action action um, action plans. And as the sustainable seafood, as part of the sustainable seafood coalition, we have this code of conduct, and we need to see um, verification of sustainability or improvement happening on our sources. So that for us is very key and, and it helps us a lot. And this, is, this is more than just good PR is it? Yeah. This is genuine commitments because uh, you know you you you, you for, for, for both personal reasons and because as, as as corporate entities you want to be able to supply your customers with fish in 100 years time which and, might, might otherwise not be available. And to ensure that it's not just good PR we make sure that we have connections through our supply chain to ensure that the, there's actual um, improvement happening and we want to keep and we keep updated on what's going on uh, on the ground. Martin, I'm going to bring you in a minute. Just Alex, just a, a word. I mean, in, as what? well as all this cooperative stuff and retail, you also need um, the, the, the bit of grit in the oyster. And that's something that NGOs can often provide, you know, by stirring things up and getting publicity and being outrageous and such like and bringing people's attention to, to an issue. I mean, how successful would you say you've been with, well, take China, for example, or Hong Kong? I mean, when you talk about sharks, surely the biggest single uh, financial incentive for, 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 for not taking measures to, to, to prevent the bycatch of sharks is the desire for shark fin soup and the, the eastern market. Uh, I, I, has awareness yeah, so, been raised to, to, to curb well, that? So what, what, what we did in Hong Kong was, um, you know, that's a very, very difficult um, thing to do, but we just, it involves just a lot of public awareness and just hammering the... The message home don't buy shark fin soup don't buy shark fin soup and then uh, but back it up with solid science and there's plenty of science out there to, that indicates that um you know that, that shark fishing and finning and the whole thing is unsustainable yes maybe there is one tiny little um uh, fishery in british columbia for uh, you know uh, spiny dogfish but generally the, for the fins that that the chinese uh, people like eating it is unsustainable and so um on top of all that kind of advocacy um, we we would uh, target the airlines and the shipping lines, and we had a, a huge success in getting them to take things a step further and realizing that um, actually um, they could be uh, exposed to legal risk by um, car by the carriage of endangered species inside consignments of of non endangered species. So the sustainability argument was less important for. Uh, carriers like Cathay Pacific or, um, you know, the, the large container shipping line like Maersk. Uh, but I think overall there's about 45 uh, airlines or more that, that are committed to not carrying it. And that was purely because of the legal risk. Um, their legal counsels got on top of them and said, look, you can't do this. We're, we're going to get in trouble if we do. Um, so now, you know, this is, that's why I keep coming back to the issue of crime. Um, I, I, ultimately, um, sustainability isn't going to make companies act. It's um, companies are susceptible to, to lawsuits. And if they know that there is some, uh, um, if they're in tangentially involved in fisheries crime, then that presents a huge legal risk to them. So whether that's human rights or 
CITES or any of these things um, that that can um, drive the market. Um, but talking of driving the market, I, I would suggest that on the fat the fad issues. Sorry to keep coming back to that, but we you know we've identified about ten scientific papers that all say that drifting fads are the worst things possible. And um, all it takes is for one domino to fall. It was the same with the airlines. We got Cathay Pacific to be the first airline to say, right, we're not going to ship shark fin anymore. And that was tremendous. And they took a huge amount of lobbying and, and courage for them to do it on their side. It, was, it, got, it got quite um, political, got, got quite toxic, but eventually they did it. And then after that, it was a, a domino effect. So the same thing could happen with fads, be, um, you know, Tesco or Walmart or any of the, the big um, supermarket chains could say, right, we've had enough of it. The science is clear. There's look at these 12 scientific papers that we've got here. All of them point to the fact that the drifting fads are complete and utter disaster, and we need to stop fiddling around on the sidelines. Stop, you know, shilly shallying and just talking about all the all the you know. Well, what are you saying, much? I mean, stuff. are you actually and saying? Then, and then just just be 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 the first one, be the brave one. Say, right, we're not going to stop you, any you... tuna from fads anymore. And then and then after the, that, the other retailers go, well, you know, these guys are right. I will do it. And that's what really changes things. And that's that would really save the environment. That would save sharks. That would save yeah, turtles. Are you, I mean, that would save just, tuna. I hear what you're saying, but are you really going to get political support for that in the in the uh, in the RFM? Well, you've got to start what somewhere, you know, haven't you? What you might, well, you know, and I'm just starting. I say you're the grit and the oyster. You should be saying that. But in, in realistically, are you not? Uh, should we? Should those of us who are trying well, to get a political agreement not be seeking proper registration? Um, registration and ownership of every fad you know rather yes than, absolutely rather than you know in the meantime we support all those you know stricter measures on fads but ultimately as a roadmap to actually banning the bloody things and in, in you know ultimately get rid of them they're awful good you know you can't argue against you can't argue against them they are evil they're horrible things let's just get rid of them consign them to the dustbin of history where they belong excellent I mean, you know, I'm sorry. Thank you. I think thanks for the passion. We're just about to end, but it's good. It's good to end on that sort of note. Over to you, Martin. <laughs> yes. Well, there's so many different topics to to cover, and as we were going along, I was tra taking uh, notes to respond to certain things. But uh, seeing that Alex mentioned fads again, I'll just sort of sketch a bit of what happened at the uh, at the IOTC discussions recently. So there was a a this call is the, for this is the Indian Ocean. Uh, at the IOTC, yeah. yes. So there was a call for improvements of how drifting fads are managed. Uh, 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 we work very closely with a Kenyan uh, delegation, many other coastal states, including South Africa, the Maldives, Somalia, uh, um, Sri Lanka, uh, co-sponsored this proposal. Uh, and we also uh, got um, many organizations from civil society, from fisher associations, and from uh, uh, the market to add their voices to this call for improved uh, fad management. We had uh, a retailer, four retailers adding uh, their names to that call for improved management, Sainsbury's, Marks and Spencer in the UK, uh, Edeka in Germany, Woolworths in South Africa. Many large international conservation organizations added their name. We ended up with a list in a very short space of time with 111 signatories uh, pushing for improved management. And the reality is there's not a single per se fad operation uh, operating with uh, transparency and uh, responsibility around the uh, ownership uh, of, of those fads and the impacts that they have. Uh, when it came to Can the you actual... Just, just, just say that again, Martin. Not a, are you saying not a single operator of a persona? Is... Not a single person operation using drifting fads uh, acts with uh, a level of transparency that's required, and not a single one of them uh, has any responsibility when it comes to the impacts associated with their fads. They switch them off. Uh, and they drift onto uh, uh, the beaches and coral uh, uh, coral banks of small coastal states that end up with a mess and have to clean it and live with the impacts of those fads for many years afterwards. And They're none so of those shady. companies uh, take the responsibility. You know, there's something called the polluters pay principle, for instance, that's been applied in many other uh, industries. We don't see that in the person industry. They pollute plastic uh, marine plastic pollution, uh, together with all the ecosystem impacts that go with that, uh, and move on. 
And as, as the Kenyan delegation said at the IOTC meeting, when, uh, you know what happened, the um, delegation from the EU, Japan, uh, not Japan, sorry, the delegation from, yes, the, uh, the EU, Japan and Korea basically said they're not willing to negotiate at all on this uh, proposed measure uh, and uh, basically walked away without any uh, improvements on how these fairs are managed. Uh, and as the de delegate of, of Kenya said at the end of this meeting, it's easy for these distant water fishing nations to, to walk away uh, when stocks have collapsed. They can go and fish elsewhere, but the coastal states sit with a mess and they are reliant uh, on these fish stocks for their livelihoods, for food security. And I think that is the reality that is often lacking uh, when we get to interventions from the market space. Martin, I, I'm Camille. I, I, I'd love to bring you in, but we've uh, we've run out of time, and you know, so many issues we'd like to explore. Might just to respond to Martin. I, I, I know the European Commission would argue that it, uh, you know, at, at these uh, at these meetings, is pressing for harvest control measures and a reduction in the total catch. So it's not uh, it's not entirely a guilty party. It would say, in fact, quite the contrary. It would, I'm sure, it would like to say it's on the side of the angels. However, people have different interpretations. The sad thing, I suppose, and we've heard a lot of depressing stories during the course of the last hour and a half, is that, you know, fishing sustainably is the win-win solution, isn't it, for fishermen, for, for, for citizens, for nature. And it just seems madness that political leaders are just failing to engage with these issues and recognise that uh, taking a short-term approach doesn't provide the long-term solutions we need. Anyway, I'm... Uh, about the money. I'm, uh, I'm uh, going to have to finish here. Uh, I want to thank uh, those who've dialed in questions and we haven't been able to address them. But in particular, I want to thank uh, Camille Derricks from the uh, uh, Marine Stewardship Council, Helena Delgado Nordman from Tesco, Resources, uh, Sustainable Resources Manager, uh, Alex Hoffard from WildAid, and uh, Martin Purvis from uh, Managing Director of the International Pole and Line Foundation, who sponsored this event, made it happen. Thank you very much indeed, Martin. Well, thank you all. Uh, if you wish to see a repeat of this or, or, uh, uh, or pass it on to one of your friends or colleagues, then it will be on the Rudd Pedersen Public Affairs website, which is called Political Festival. That's where all the previous Blue Deal debates are. Uh, once again, thank, thank you all. Wish we had more time. Wish we had all the solutions. Wish we could ensure we had the political will to bring them about. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Chris. Thank you. Bye.